You have a place in the church. The body of Jesus Christ is the local church, and you have a place in it. Friends, uh, what's a memory of church that makes you smile? Some of you would have got that message from me during the week, and I wonder if you've got something in your mind that when you think about something that's happened in church, it makes you smile. And if you've got something that comes to mind, I'm hoping you've got lots of things, but if you've got one thing that comes to mind, you might like to just drop that into the public chat uh, box and we can uh, talk about that and something we will uh, share later on. Uh, We're in a time where we don't want to be in. We're in a time where church is happening in a really strange, uh, difficult and I'm going to say a wrong way. It's not how we want church to be. We want to be able to come together. We want to be able to meet together in a place dedicated for God's glory or even in a place used for God's glory for just that uh, couple of hours a week. But we can't. And here in Melbourne, we certainly can't as we are locked down, as we need to be at home and we can't get out. And so Psalm 42 Uh, contains a verse that is really helpful for us in considering our own time because the psalmist tells us to remember. To remember what you used to do. Do you remember? Do you remember coming to church? Do you remember where you would sit? Do you remember what the building looks like? Do you remember the people who would sit around you? Well, we'll see some photos of them a little later on. Now, when it comes to remembering what you used to do, one of the interesting things that I'm finding as I get older uh, is that as I remember those things that I used to be able to do, it kind of makes me sadder rather than happier. I remember fun times with my bass guitar. I remember uh, playing in a band at a Youth for Christ camp in Queensland in the late 80s. And while I might still be able to play bass guitar, if I was to jump around the stage now like I did then, it would look, well, probably a bit weird. Uh, Or being able to stay up really late one night and to be able to get through the next day as well. These are things I used to be able to do, but that time has passed. And strange as it is, some of my happiest memories Uh, can also leave a bit of sadness with me as I reflect on them because that time has passed and that time will never come again. Now, one of our sons had his birthday this week and uh, I remember him as a a little boy, a little child, sitting on my knee and cuddling in and how delightful that is. But now that he's taller than me, um, that doesn't happen anymore. In verse 4 of Psalm 42, there is this lovely phrase. These things I remember. As I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. These things I remember. Well, Psalm 42 is a psalm that is a great help to Christians who are dealing with their own depression and darkness. And the point here is to reflect on his reality that what he could do in the past, he can't do now. Does it sound like anyone you know? It sounds like you, doesn't it? The things you used to be able to do in the past, you can't do now. How I used to go to the house of God. Well, here there are happy memories. Happy memories of crowds in worship. And he describes them as shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Well, some of my great memories of church, some of the things that make me smile, uh, happened in great crowds. Happened by attending youth events with hundreds of teenagers from across the state. Or sometimes from across across the country when I was a teenager. Here I would be part of a much larger crowd of people singing worshipping and learning. Everything was different from normal church on a Sunday. We were being encouraged in our faith and we were being deeply challenged in our faithfulness to Jesus. It really was a festive throng and I saw Jesus move in the lives of people in those times. 
Well, the psalmist remembers such times too. But now he finds himself in a position where he can't be involved in these activities. Is he pleased about this? Is he glad that he doesn't have to face these people anymore? Oh, at last, I can have some time to myself. No. As you read his words, and as you, as you feel the emotion in those words, we recognize that he is not delighted about this. That as he remembers it, it's not, oh, it was great. It's sad because he can't do it now. But his desire isn't so much for the people, the festive throng, as delightful as that is. His passion is for God, the living God. Look back at verse 1. As the deer pants for living water, so my soul longs for you, O God. It's later that he remembers the festive throng. But even that was about connecting with God. So there is for him happy memories of crowds in worship. And I hope that you might have some happy memories of that too. And there is the sadness of not being able to do this now. And I want to say it's a good sadness. It's good that he feels sad that he can't come together with a festive throng. It's good that he feels sad that he is unable to meet together with others in worship. And it's good, therefore, that we are feeling sad that we can't meet together with others in worship. In the States last week, uh, one very well-known church decided to open up and bring people together for worship against the advice of their governor. Now, listening to a podcast about that during the week, and the commentator said, just how good it was to see people gathered together in a place in a church. How good it was to see people gathered together around the word of God. And how delightful it was to see and to hear people singing the praises of God. But he went on to say, but it was kind of uncomfortable also watching all these people in this building singing uh, close together, some not wearing masks. And wondering what the outcome of that might be. Well, the people were sad and wanted to get together. And they've done so. Now I expect most of us have had the thought, wouldn't it be nice to be able to sleep in on a Sunday? Just like the pagans do. Wouldn't it be nice not to get up and race off to church and and home and all that goes on with that? Well, if you've ever prayed that prayer, your prayer has been answered. But I expect that like young Kevin in Home Alone, you've recognised that there's a dark side to that prayer that you might not have first considered. What is it that you miss about church right now? What is it that you really miss about coming together on a Sunday morning? If something comes to mind, jot it down somewhere. And when we get together in our groups after church, After our worship time, well, it's all worship. You know what I mean. Uh, We'll have the chance to discuss that. What do you miss about church right now? I miss seeing your faces while I'm speaking. It's just not the same looking down a camera lens. Uh, this, This sadness, though, is a good sadness because it reminds us of what we miss. But it's also a distressing sadness. And for some of us, Uh, For some of us, it is distressing because we kind of recognize that at some point in life, this will be our experience. That for most people, there reaches a time in life where they can no longer attend worship, where they can no longer gather with the festive throng, simply because of age or because of illness. We have some people in our congregation like that right now. And I can tell you as a, as a minister, uh, it's a terrible thing to arrive at a church and then for, you know, to receive a message you know, eight months later that this lady has passed away and then to hear from everybody else about, oh, she was such a, a firm believer in Christ. She loved Jesus. She was here every week. She was doing this. She was doing that. She was an amazing disciple of Jesus. And here's me. As the pastor, 
And for me, she was just a name on a page. Nobody had ever told me about who she was. Well, there's a good lesson in that for me, but I want to pass that lesson to you as well. Just because people aren't here on a Sunday, it doesn't mean they're not a part of our church community. So please keep in touch with them. One day, it will be your turn. Keep that in mind. I want to say too that this time of sadness of separation is a shared sadness. Well, across Melbourne, indeed across the world, that's been the case for all countries. You know, the best developed countries have had churches who have had to meet online and we've all done it in an instant. But around the world, there are people for whom this is not abnormal. This is their usual routine. That they can't get together in a building dedicated for that purpose. That they can't meet together with others for worship. Why? Well, in some countries, there is a government crackdown on Christians. It's not a thing of history. It happens still today. China stands, maybe not at the top of the tree, but right up there uh, in that regard, where people who truly want to worship Jesus and Jesus alone as Lord do so at great peril. There are those for whom it is dangerous to meet together. China is one of those. But other countries too, where it is dangerous to meet together. Not essentially because of a government crackdown, but sometimes because governments and authorities don't get in the way of violence against Christians. And there are parts of Africa where that is the case. There are other places where there's actually not many other Christians in the area to meet with. And in my reading in recent weeks, it's been distressing to read about Syria, Iraq. You know the places we read about in the New Testament where the gospel took hold and churches grew? To recognize that now they are places who are bereft of Christians? Well, friends, the sadness that we share right now in being separated is a shared sadness. But we want to trust that we will meet again. And so we come to verse 5 of Psalm 42 and we find these great words. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Well, we should be at this time. But here's the advice. Put your hope in God. Here's the advice you need to tell yourself. Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. Put your hope in God. Not in our government. I think our government are actually doing a pretty good job. I think there's been a few failings, but I'm not sure that's all the government's fault. But I'm not going to put my final hope in the government. Put your hope in God, not in the church. We want to be able to get together, but our final hope is not in the gathering of God's people. Our final hope is in God himself. So put your hope in God and not in a vaccine. Oh, we pray that that might come, that something might be developed to to halt the spread of this virus so that life can go back to some sense of normality, where people can meet together in worship, where grandparents can cuddle their grandchildren. Put your hope in God. And let your hope in God lead you back to church. I want to ask you to jump to Romans chapter 12 now. And having recognised what we can't do and and remembering those days, we don't want to stay there. So now I want to say to you, in this time, let us do what servants of Jesus do. Let's do it. Um, But before we jump into the, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, uh, we need to say, well, why are we going to do these things? Why should we do anything at all? What is our motivation? And so Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 gives us our motivation. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. In view of God's mercy. Now the word therefore, and remembering this is chapter 12, means what we're going to read in chapter 12 follows from everything we've read or everything that comes earlier. And there's a lot that comes earlier, describing how we have come to be a child of God. 
Therefore, in view of God's mercy, we do these things. But don't ever think you're asked to do these things to earn your salvation. That's not the case. And don't ever think we do these things to find, hoping we can find favour with God. No doubt God is pleased when we do these things, just as a parent is pleased to find their child willingly washing the dishes. But our prime motivation is the mercy of God shown to us. And I want to unpack that um, a little, and I'm going to need the help of my uh, wonderful assistant, who will keep her mask on uh, for this time. So you need to uh, make sure you're in, you're in shot here. Excellent. Just come over so we can see who's actually holding the board. There we go. It's not, uh, it's not Mr. Squiggle. That's for sure. So Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 is really helpful here. And it re reminds us of some things that we have. Uh, wages. And wages are things that we, that's what we're paid for what we do. Um, sin. And this is what we're getting paid for. And what are the wages of sin? Well, the Bible tells us the wages of sin is death. I'm not sure how well you can see that. But, uh, but it's there. Um, but we compare that to what God is giving to us. And so Romans 6, 23, I should put that up here. If you've got your Bible open to Romans, you can check that. Uh, Romans 6, 23, wages of sin is death. So here's the comparison. The gift of God. And so wages are something you earn, but here is a gift, something that you haven't earned. Is it God? Hang on, sorry. Gift compared to wages. Sin, this comes from God. And instead of death, the gift of God is eternal life. You can probably tell I'm not a school teacher. So the gift of God is eternal life. How? And here comes the, uh, the clincher. When we talk about God's mercy shown to us in Christ Jesus. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. How? Through Christ Jesus. And his death on the cross is what makes that available to us. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, friends... As I say this, I also want to say to you that this free gift, this gift, is offered to you. You are earning here, but here is a gift from God. And like a birthday gift, it's not much good sitting on a shelf. Take it. Unwrap it. Use it. Here is a gift of God to you. Eternal life through Jesus Christ. Thanks, Anne. And it's because of that that we can be like the writer of Psalm 42 and we can put our hope in God. Not because we've earned it, not because we're spectacular, but because of God's great mercy. So what do we do? What do we do within the church? Well, look at verses 3 to 13. Uh, and I want to say to you just quickly and very practically, create new memories. I've asked what are the things that... Some good memories of church. I don't know if there's been much response to that. There'll be a few things good. Uh, what made you sad about the church? Well, I want to say to you, create new memories. Uh, the good old days are today. So create the new memories. Don't just lament about the past, but make sure there is something today to remember tomorrow. Now, if you're keeping a journal, keeping a journal of 2020 might seem an exercise in despair. But there was a pandemic in 1918. And it is interesting to read people's experiences there. Not just the official documents, but general documents, family documents. Imagine if you were keeping a journal of 2020. It might not mean much to you, but to your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, social historians years from now might find it really interesting to know. How did Christians cope? In 2020. Anyway, here Paul gives a list of things we can do. 
And so verse 3 talks about, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Now, we are all part of one body in the church. But verse 6, though, uh, I'm going to use a slightly different translation because I think the NIV kind of misses something here. I'm going to read from the English Standard Version. If you have a question about those different versions, then shoot that through to Anne and we'll answer that as well. Uh, so verse 6 in the NIV begins with, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. I think the ESV makes it a little clearer when it says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. What are Christians supposed to do now? Those gifts that you have, let us use them. Please put them into practice. Use the gifts that you have. And if you're not sure what you can do, what gifts God might have given you to serve his church, well, please take some time to look at the things mentioned in verses 6 to 8, because I'm quietly confident that there is at least one thing here that you can do. I'm quietly confident there's a whole lot more than that. But there's at least one thing that you can do. So we see prophesying, preaching, uh, serving, teaching, encouraging, giving, leading, and showing mercy and how we should do that. Friends, all of these are important. All of them are important. And without them all being used, the whole church suffers. There are churches where the teaching is terrible and churches suffer for that. But I know there are also churches where the teaching is excellent, but no one is serving. And so the church suffers for that. Or there are churches where there is no one giving. And so the church suffers for that. And churches where the elders aren't leading. And then the church certainly suffers. Now you might look at this list and say, well, I'm not gifted. I'm not gifted to preach or prophesy. I'm not a leader. And showing mercy is really hard when I you know, just want to tell people what they should do. But in the middle is this little comment. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. You can do that. Encouragement matters. This is something that we were reminded of in our Six Steps to Loving Your Church studies that we went through. Thank you for your feedback on that. And encouragement can be as simple as a phone call or a text message or a card in the mail. I wonder when's the last time you received a card in the mail? When's the last time you sent someone a card in the mail? So let me encourage you to give things a go. While we should uh, note that, sorry, we should also note that while those who are gifted should absolutely put that gift into action, the Bible does not say, well, if the generous are giving, you don't need to worry about it. Nor does it teach, if there are others in the church showing mercy and doing it cheerfully, you don't need to worry about that either. Not at all. We can all. You can all do all of these things. And if you are gifted at them, do them diligently, remembering two things. First, our motivation is the mercy of God that has been shown to us. And second, these gifts differ according to the grace given to us, which means that what might be really simple for you is actually much harder for someone else. Use the gifts that you have. Jump down to verse 12, and, and here's some simple advice for Christians at this time. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Three simple statements. Joyful in hope. Hope of what? Well, I'm going to suggest the hope that we will be back in church again. And knowing that because Jesus is Lord, and he has called us to meet together. To be patient in affliction. Well, what kind of affliction does he mean here? Well, perhaps being locked in for six weeks might count for something there. And to be faithful in prayer. Well, here's some good guidance. To be faithful in prayer. Now, I talked about keeping a journal of 2020. Perhaps I could encourage you also to find a notebook and just keep a record of your prayers during this pandemic. 
It's been interesting as uh, I trawl through YouTube trying to find songs that we can use on a Sunday morning to read the comments under it. And amongst uh, Christian songs, there are almost every comment written in the last few weeks is praying, Lord, end this pandemic. Let this time pass. People are praying. I trust that you are one of them too. Verses 14 to 21, or the, chapter 12 tells us what we should do inside the church. But I think verses 14 to 21 really suggest to us, particularly outside the church, this is how we should act and what we should do. But also, because the church is made up of people, uh, we do well to let these words guide us within the church as well. And I want to direct your attention to verse 15 in particular. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Uh, This is a really difficult time of life to do that. We want to rejoice with those who rejoice. And I think of a wedding, a time of great rejoicing. But we can't gather together for that. I saw a thing on Facebook this week that not far from here, Uh, On a footpath in a park, a couple got married. And I say, good on them. And I rejoiced with them, even though they didn't have their crowd around them. And to mourn with those who mourn. Well, there are many in our world who have reason to mourn at the moment. We've prayed for and we will continue to pray for Kirk Bray and for all that is happening there. We mourn with those who have died and with those whose life has been turned upside down as they've been transferred out of the place that they know. And we also mourn for the staff who can't work because they are infected or because they are close contact to someone who is infected. We mourn with those who mourn. I conducted a funeral last week and it was one of the most difficult things I've done. I know the family. It was, you know, as far as the funeral service goes, it was lovely. But to realise there were seven people there and, and no one was sitting next to each other. It was awkward. It was uncomfortable. It kind of added to the mourning and took away from the celebrating. But at the same time, we rejoice with those who rejoice at the same time. Through the pandemic, there have been reasons to rejoice though they may be hard to see. So share them with us. Tony has asked you to share uh, those moments of thanksgiving that can go into our church newsletter. Please send them through to her so that we can share them. We want to rejoice with you in all things, no matter how big or how small. And some of the flowers that have been in the newsletter in the last few weeks, some of them are really small, but those signs of life bring us great joy. Well, if you are in despair at the moment because your world is upside down, we feel that with you and we pray for you knowing that our great God is faithful. If you are thankful and rejoicing just now, then we share that with you too. I'm coming to the conclusion. And if you have any questions about the sermon you want to shoot through to Anne, uh, do that now. And then we will uh, take a moment to answer them if we can. Um, because I've juggled some things around, we don't have a song to uh, complete or after the sermon. Friends, earlier I asked you to think about those memories of church that made you smile. And I hope there were many. And I'm glad there are. The question? Mm-hmm. Things to make you smile? Mm-hmm. Tell, pass it over. Here we go. Here's something that someone said. Uh, realizing the significance of Jesus. What a wonderful thing to happen in church. Uh, Jesus loves me during the... Oh, I can't read that, in. It's the singing of Jesus loves me during the reading of the Bible reading. Oh, yes. So something happened at church. A Bible reading was happening, and uh, behind us was a little girl just quietly singing, Jesus loves me, this I know. A gorgeous moment. Um, most of all... 
there are many things that will make us smile, but I really hope that your greatest memory in church relates to your own salvation. The moment when you realize that Jesus truly is Lord and your only hope for a better life in this for a better life in this world and the world to come. So it's good to hear that somebody has actually written that. I hope you might also remember times when someone else came to faith in Jesus and was able to trust him in all things. Well, friends, I believe those days are not past. I hope that in years to come, we might be able to remember 2020, not just as the year the world broke, but also as the year that Jesus worked in amazing ways in our community. So put your hope in God knowing that he is merciful and that his mercy is fully offered and revealed in Jesus. I'm going to pray and then we'll answer any questions that come. A loving God, thank you again for the beauty of your word, for these uh, ancient words that are so relevant for us, that those words from Psalm 42 are really describing our own experiences remembering coming to worship you uh, with others with a festive throng but now we can't do that and our hearts break and so we put our hope in you and we remind ourselves that you are our god and thank you too lord that your word teaches us that even though we can't come together into the one building that the church is still the church and that there are things that we can and should be doing and so, Lord, as we read through Romans 12 and see there those, those gifts that you give to people and the encouragement and the advice, simple, practical advice you give to us, Lord, spur us on that we might put these things into practice. And for those of us who have gifts in those areas, let us be unashamed and unafraid to use them. And for those of us who might look at that list and think, well, none of that describes me, well, then, Lord, encourage us to... Give it a go, to be an encourager, to show mercy, to give, whatever it might be. Lord, again, we pray for our friends as they wait for the birth of their child. And pray that in your grace, it will not be long, but trust that all will go well. That we might rejoice with those who rejoice. This Lord, all of this we ask in view of your mercy, and for the glory of God, through Jesus our Saviour. Amen.